A mere whimsy of fate made me black and you white. Might have easily been the other way around. You were born with the blessing of providence. Hands were extended to help you the day you were born. You may go as far as your capabilities permit. But me, the cards are stacked against me the day I was born. I can go just so far and no further. America, the land of the free. But in the early decades of the 20th century, black Americans experienced a harsher side to this free society. How real for them was the American dream? This program reconstructs the stories of four black Americans from those years. Their words survive because in the late 1930s, they were each interviewed by the Federal Writers Project, an oral history project paid for by the U.S. government. 10,000 Americans were interviewed in all, their lives, their experiences written down, filed away in the Library of Congress. 10,000 American voices. I was born the 12th son in a family of 13 children. My father was a sharecropper. He killed himself working for old man Whitelaw on a 12 horse plantation outside Benneville, South Carolina. He worked hard. He made good crops. But he was always in the hole at the end of the year. Walter Coachman, a Baptist pastor, described his life to the Federal Writers Project in 1939. South Carolina, where he lived, was a cotton state in America's deep south. In Walter's day, the population here was 40% black. Originally, America's black population had been brought there by force to work as slaves on the cotton plantations. By the early 20th century, slavery was long abolished, but Walter's parents, like many poor blacks, remained tied to land they didn't own, dependent on a local white farmer. They were sharecroppers, taking, as the name suggests, a share of the crop. It was a hard life. I realized early in life that I was a Negro and that it was the lot of our people to get the butt end of everything. My mother was a woman of forceful character. She fought tooth and toenail to see that we children got some education. I went to a one-room Negro school about three miles from where we lived. I learned to read, write, and figure. And when I was 12 years old, I began to figure against old man Whitelaw. My father had me hitch up the two-horse wagon to haul in the corn, two loads to Mr. Whitelaw's barn, and one to ours. Well, I made a mistake. I took two loads to our barn and one to Mr. Whitelaw's. Honest? Of course it was honest. Didn't know old man Whitelaw charged my father $12 an acre for corn land? I wasn't a fool, even as a child. My mother was in full accord. Pappy always used to say it was a sin to take advantage of people. Pappy was a good Christian Negro, but he was too meek to suit my mother. The whites in the South weren't all rich plantation owners, far from it. But most, rich and poor, were determined to keep alive the racist hierarchy of the old slave days. State laws, the so-called Jim Crow laws, segregated blacks from white, keeping them apart. According to the American Constitution, blacks could vote, 
But state laws blocked that right with requirements for literacy or land ownership that blacks could rarely meet. Whites often deluded themselves that the blacks accepted their situation. The reality was they had no choice because behind the force of the law was the threat of violence. The Ku Klux Klan, a white supremacist movement, had grown in strength. Everyone knew the penalty for stepping out of line. Only the other day, I was walking down the street, and I saw a little colored boy and a little white boy fighting. A group of whites had gathered and were shouting encouragement to the white child. On the other side had grouped a bunch of Negroes, and they were pulling for the colored boy. Well, the white boy was much larger, and the colored boy was crying pitifully and taking an awful beating. The Negroes could see the unfairness of it all, and you could feel the tension between the two warring groups. Now, I learned long ago that diplomacy will get you a lot further than being pig-headed because you're right. So I quietly eased in, and when the children separated, I grasped a little colored boy by the hand and walked on down the road, talking to him softly to soothe him. I didn't look back, and I didn't talk to anybody else except that child. Suppose I'd been outspoken it would have been striking a match to dynamite. What then could Southern blacks do? Take pride in their families, in their traditions, in their faith. Walter Coachman served a small Baptist congregation. They paid for the oil and gas for his car so he could get around and minister to the parish. He preached humility, kindness, dignity. A Christian response to an unjust situation. 